from your favorite source for Chicago White Sox talk, delivering news, interviews, analysis, and more. This is the Sox Machine Podcast with your hosts, Jim Margulis and Josh Nelson. Thanks, Rob, and welcome to a new episode of the Sox Machine Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Nelson. It's Thursday night, June 29, 2023, as we record a new podcast episode Skipping the live stream this week. I apologize, everyone. I'm getting married next week. There's a lot going on for me outside of the podcast of the writing on Socks Machine uh, going into next week. Speaking of lots going on, in this episode, we are recapping the Chicago White Sox first half of the 2023 season. At the halfway point, they were 34 and 47. But now that the White Sox offense woke up the last two games, they are 36 and 47. And shockingly, still four and a half games back of Minnesota and Cleveland in the American League Central. Yes, the Cleveland Guardians have caught the Twins. We'll hand out our grades, pick who we think are the best position player and pitcher of the first half. And at the end of this episode, we'll preview the White Sox next series as they head to Oakland to face the Athletics. Joining me is the managing editor of SoxMachine.com. It's Jim Margulis. Hello, Jim. Howdy. And also joining us is James Fegan. Hello, James. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my wife told me that even though this wasn't TV, if I'm on camera, I should shower before this. So if you're really <laughs> excited about sweaty, unemployed men uh, on your feed, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint. Well, you look terrific. So for those that are listening to the podcast episode, if you want to see James and his sweaty look, uh, go to YouTube.com slash Sheet to see that. <laughs> Uh, all right, so quickly, let's talk about what happened this week bef- between the White Sox and the Angels. The first two games, very disheartening as the White Sox offense did nothing against Reed Detmers and Shohei Otani. But in the last two games, they have scored 20 runs, 11 and 9, respectively, in those good in those games, uh, which is a good sign. Hell, even Tim Anderson had a multi-hit game on Thursday, which is very encouraging. And now they head to Oakland. And Jim... It seems like this is an opportunity for the White Sox to make a mini run here, to win these last two games against the Angels the way that they did, and now heading to Oakland, which I know has not been a friendly place for them to play, but the athletics are historically bad. Like, we've been talking about the White Sox need to go on more frequent five-game winning streaks. They're kind of set up to do that. They are, and especially with the offense leading the way the last couple of games, uh, 20 runs over the last two, sustained threats, drawing some walks, uh, not many walks, but more than zero walks, which is what they usually draw. Uh, There's a semblance of an offense here. Tim Anderson coming up with a couple of hits. Zach Remillard, whether he's lightning in a bottle or not, he's giving the White Sox what they need, which is like some idea of balls and strikes to the plates and the ability to put the ball in play in useful ways, which helps. So that's setting up innings for Luis Robert, Eloy Jimenez and Luis Robert, which, right. And uh, Andrew Vaughn, I should say, uh, which wasn't happening before, which is why, you know, Robert was hitting all those solo shots. So that's happening now. And I think like, you know, Oakland's pitching staff should facilitate more of that. Um, you know, then Toronto and St. Louis are around the corner. And that's when I think you start getting into professional teams again, that actually have, you know, pitching staffs that are strong from, you know, top of the rotation in the middle of the bullpen. So, yeah, I mean, normally you don't like having to sweep any team because it's Major League Baseball and, you know, every team should be able to win one out of three games. But given the hole they dug themselves and given how they look and given that they're in relatively good health and workloads are meted out okay in the bullpen, like, yeah, I mean, they're positioned to do it. And you have to put a dent in that awful April somehow, and they missed opportunities to do that in May. So here's an opportunity now. And if they're going to do it, this would be a time. And James, for those that did not see the White Sox season before this week, let's say they were under a rock, they missed the first 79 games of the season, and they only watched these four games against the Angels. I think they get a very good understanding of how this White Sox offense has been sputtering in the first half. They're very boom or bust. Can you make heads or tails of why that is for this particular White Sox offense? Why? We fall into despair because they can't score more than a run or two. And then, bam, they score 11. And then they score nine the next day. Um, well, if you watch them last year, you're, like, pretty much good. Since, like, all the problems <laughs> from last season that we were worried about um, kind of got worse, um, if if not just stayed kind of steady. Um, I, I think – I mean, I'm kind of, like – 
watched it from a much more casual perspective and just kind of rolling in like, wow, holy cow, they drew nine walks the last two games. Uh, I guess that's a sign of progress, but that only probably is good enough to take them out of the hole of the worst on base percentage. Maybe well, they were still entering today, the worst on base percentage in baseball. I think if they were good at everything else, we'd be wondering what their ceiling could be, what they could really accomplish with the worst on base percentage of baseball. But this was not a team that's like going to be airtight to everything else. This is a team that is going to have problems defensively. This is a team that you know didn't have starting pitching depth behind the, the starting five, really, or behind the, the top six. And, you know, obviously Davis Martin is out. Um, if you don't get on base, you, it's really hard to win baseball games consistently at any level. You have to hit like four home runs in a game. And even then you might score four runs, which I believe that they've done this year, uh, possibly <laughs> multiple times. Uh, they don't get on base. That's That's the reason... That they struggle. That's the reason they're inconsistent. That's why the reason why they seem like they can, you know, string together hits or what was it, the, the the streak to start the season where they had double digit hits like eight out of nine games or something like that. If they're not doing that, they're not really that functional as an offense. And you know, they they have it's it's hard to just hit ten hits per game, and they they have a, they've proven that over the course of the season. Yeah, before my radio hit with Lawrence Holmes and six seventy the score. So this is before the Thursday game between the White Sox and Angels. Luis Robert had 10 home runs in the month of June and 15 RBIs, Jim. Like, Mm -hmm. unbelievable. How can you have that few of RBIs with 10 home runs? I was like, I'm surprised it's not 13, (laughs) given the way just the the innings have unfolded. Yeah, no, it's especially like with Benintendi doing an okay job at the top of the order once the fall flipped that. Like, you would think that, you know, if it were, say, like last year's Larry Garcia and this year's Tim Anderson going one, two at the top and then like, oh, yeah, of course. But given that Ben and has been good as, as a leadoff guy and, and drawing enough walks or like the only guy drawing walks and running the bases well enough, you would think there'd be something. But just having Anderson second and kind of entrenched in the top two spots when he's not hitting, although he came up with a couple of hits uh, today. But it's just that's... Uh, you know, Robert hasn't been hitting well with runners in scoring position too, so it's partially his fault. But when you have so few opportunities, it, it gets back to the idea of on-base percentage. Like every team, I would say most teams complain about how they hit with runners in scoring position. Like I'm watching, reading Dan Hayes' coverage on the Twins, and like they're basically yeah. the exact same thing the White Sox are doing. And, and the same problem too with like striking out, not getting on base, and, and not capitalizing on the few opportunities they have. The White Sox have that as well, where if they go 0 for 7 with runners in scoring position, it's like, yeah, that's bad, but also like they should probably be getting like 11 or 12 chances in a given game. Uh, and, you know, going 3 for 12 versus 0 for 7 is a, is a pretty big difference. And that's kind of how it feels. These games are, a lot of the games they've lost are games where they just don't have that many opportunities. And every failure in those opportunities is magnified. So to have a game uh, like today's game where they just kept, you know, kept the line moving and kept having opportunities and cashing in, but they only got opportunities because they cashed in the few opportunities they had. So it's like they, they, they are not creating opportunities outside of like big innings, which it's nice when you have a big inning, but also um, if you don't, if you miss that one opportunity to capitalize, uh, it looks a lot like innings. What was it? Four through eight where, Mm -hmm. you know, Mike Trout takes away a Homer and that was the offense. Yeah, big hit by Eloy Jimenez with the White Sox down four to one. The two run single against Patrick Sandoval kind of blew up the door, uh, blew the doors open for the White Sox of that inning on their way of scoring six runs. One player in particular, when it comes to the offense and this topic, before we talk about the first half, James. And I'm not saying that there's grumblings because everyone's still pretty happy for the way that Jake Berger has recovered and the way that he has started this season. But Jake Berger is starting to get cold here. And it's starting, the strikeouts are really starting to pile up here. And he's not making that much of an impact. And and it's funny, his OPS is still in the 600s in the month of June, even though his batting average and on basis crater, because he's hit seven home runs in this month. And it seems like if he doesn't hit a home run, he's not doing much else. What are your thoughts about Berger so far? Is this just a cold streak at him? adjusting to major league pitching or was this always going to be a short life cycle i mean it's this cold streak it's probably a down period i don't think he's just like unusable and incapable of making adjustments but also the profile always tended at boom and bust he was always kind of at a like 30k rate even when he was running hot where you know as much as you know the offense didn't really justify putting him down or um you know the, the way he was hitting could have 
mandated a better or quicker response as far as prioritizing and giving everyday rate. It, they already showed you that these kind of stretches were going to happen in a way that I thought, at least even if I didn't agree with the level of caution or how slow the coaching staff was to kind of move him up, I saw why the logic was let's not overexpose this. Let's, you know, play a cool on this or let's hunt for matchups for this because there is a lot of exposure to right-handed pitching where he would be a probably a, a sub 300 OP guy with a 30 north of 30% strikeout rate. I, I think that was present. I think when we were in a stretch where he swung at 25 pitches in a row, it was like really funny because he was hot, but it was like, <laughs> yeah, that's probably not going to be great. Uh, you know, with no bumps in a row going forward. Um, so yeah, I, I think we're seeing a little bit of adjustment period. I think it'll bounce back to some degree, but I think this is also, this has been probably part of the profile, even in triple a a little bit where you'd see him be, you know, he wasn't ever a, walks and you know high 380s OBP guy he, he was always a guy who's going to be flirting at the 300 OBP and hopefully the power to justify it they obviously needs to get it you don't want to see him sinking to a, a depth he sank but um I, I think this is the profile a little bit um I think if there's enough power and he's healthy and uh he provides speed yeah I still think it's you know you can make an argument it's it's more appealing to the fans than seeing Yaman kind of injured all the time uh but this I think these are real warts we're seeing. I just don't think it's like, you know, it's never going to be good again. Um, cancel Christmas, <laughs> cancel 4th of July, um, never eat a burger again type of thing. Well, with the two wins for the White Sox, they're currently 13-12 and 12 in the month of June. So, Jim, tip your cap. You, you called at the beginning of the month. The White Sox will probably finish at 500 for this month or even slightly above 500 if they could win on Friday against Oakland. Again, we'll preview that series later in the show. The White Sox could have a winning month against what was a very tough schedule. However, there's still 11 games below 500 and they're still in this race because, my lord, everyone in the American League Central is bad. And I guess that is a strategy for the White Sox is to continue to wade the waters and hope everyone floats down to them. Uh, or at some point that they're going to have to get hot. That's what we're hoping here after these two wins and now heading to Oakland. But James, to circle back to you, when looking at the White Sox after the first half, it started our first half recap of this season. What do you think is the biggest reason why the White Sox are 36 and 47 at this point of the season? Uh, well, I already get the, they didn't get on base thing, right? Um, is it is that simple? I, it's I just that think, they don't get on base. I think, Anything else I bring up, like, yeah, they're not a great defensive team. Uh, I think they're, you know, in the bottom of like sports info solutions as team rankings and stuff like that. Uh, you know, they're obviously we're talking about can they sweep in Oakland when they're going to throw two bullpen games, which is uh, usually not the ingredient for that. Um, you know, the relief pitching, they've obviously taken a lot of injuries and was really horrid in April. I could, you know, we, you could bring up the fact that like, given the toughness of the schedule, even before the season, you could say, Hey, if they went 500 in June, that'd be a win. But now it's, it doesn't feel adequate because April was just so mind bendingly awful that like no amount of treading water can be justified because you need to go on this huge run to kind of cancel this out somehow. And like the whole rationale throughout this is like, well, we'll get hot at some point and wipe this away. But that I don't think with the, the OBP issues, there's not really a consistency you have to ever really go on a run that wipes away just how bad they were in April. I mean, kind of, there was some element of like shaking out the leverage ladder, the relief tree, where they went to the year thinking as Ronaldo Lopez. And now Ronaldo, I mean, he still hasn't been probably what you think he would be, but even just shaking him out to where he's the guy you see coming in the, the sixth or seventh and maybe the eighth inning of some games is a lot more palatable than like, He's going to face the middle of the order no matter what, uh, or he's going to be our closer, you know, closing or the highest leverage outs of the game, no matter what really didn't go well in April. Um, some of that correction and the fact that you rolled in the season with Diekman and, and Ruiz and neither of them really survived the first month and you were using him in medium to high leverage for points of that season, that level of like, you know, the, the, the phrase effing around and find out gets thrown around a lot, but they're, they're spending kind of, the opening month doing that with their bullpen and it really bore the cost to an unreasonable degree in that opening months to the way it's going to, you know, a, a mediocre team, which I feel like even if they've normalized, we, I, I think we've, we've accepted that's what they are. Can't afford that level of hit. I think if that happened in Minnesota, if that happened in Cleveland, that'd be season wrecking. So um, if I can't use the answer of just, they don't get on base again, I would say 
April went so poorly, like they're not they're not suited to recover from it from the way they're built. And they need it, it, it's one of those countless, you know, 85 wins and let's hope quality of teams that we've seen, you know, countless times over the course of the last 20 years. And those teams need a hot start to ever justify themselves to add at the deadline. And the White Sox got the polar opposite of that. So uh, I know it's kind of, you know, circular logic to say they were so bad in April, but I think one of the reasons that they're they're not satisfied now is just everything went wrong in April. Yeah. I mean, if you exclude April, Jim, like this is a 500 team that we're talking about, but you know, to James's point, they were so bad in April. Like that's why they're still 11 games below 500. Is is there another reason, Jim, that you could think of that is the biggest reason why the White Sox are still 11 games below 500 at this point? Well, it is April, but uh, you know, going back to that performance in April, and I think if you were to try to find any strength with this team, it would probably be the rotation with Lynn and Cease and Giolito probably you know, being an unmatched top three in the division. Michael Kopech being a pretty good fourth if he's healthy. Mike Clevenger being like a standard fifth with some upside and and maybe some maybe less downside than other fifth starters in the division. And when you look at what they did in April, like Lynn was 0-4, Mike Kopech was 0-3, they had ERAs above 7. Uh, Giolito was pretty good aside from like one bad start, but Cease was mediocre, uh, especially by his standards. And then Clevenger was okay, but flawed and, and, you know, just could get blown up in an inning or two. And, you know, when you look at that, then you, you look at the innings they weren't covering and then more innings for the bullpen to have to be tinkered with and not just be like, oh, we got we have the seventh, eighth, ninth to cover. Like they had the fifth and sixth too to stretch some guys out into. And that made things a little bit more uncertain. Like without that strength or without like the rotation looking like a strength early on, uh, they just were basically all weaknesses. And that's, I think, reflected in the record. And now that, you know, they ever since they went on that stretch of like 13 games in a row where maybe they weren't quality starts, but there were starts you could win with, uh, they've more or less stabilized into like this okay team. But, you know, I think there's a little bit of foreshadowing here with Clevenger out, Kopech being a little bit of mystery, uh, to where like, now you're flirting with this again. Like you're flirting with like needing Jesse Schultons to be more than just, uh, somebody they're being very careful with and how they're deploying him. And, you know, pushing the envelope a little bit with the, with the two bullpen games uh, that James mentioned uh, it could go tumbling down again. So I think Griffal has to be very careful with like this. Now that the rotation has resembled something that uh, they thought they could win with, like it has to make sure that doesn't just completely go uh, capsize on them. A point I want to throw in is like, as we, the White Sox are kind of like you know, that SpongeBob meme of looking longingly at the Reds, like having this fun and young up and coming team. A big degree of like kind of electrifying the team that was, you know, trading water or 500 ish is that they're able to pull out their top prospects and kind of say, like, hey, this guy is running hot and double A AA and triple A. Like, let's give him a shot and let's kind of energize the team. The White Sox, like, everyone who could have been that, you know, would be a reach. They'd have to hit like a 90 percentile outcome, but they don't have any of that. They, you know, Brian Ramos couldn't like get hot at double a because he missed the first two months of the season same thing for colson montgomery sean burke you know has had you know had the shoulder thing in spring and was delayed and you know has been up and down they don't have like a guy who's caught fire in the minors who they can really ride and give some run or, or see if it's sustainable in the majors jose rodriguez you know had has been on the il a little bit and had an up and down start you know even if you know i don't like their policy of come up and do nothing uh, he hasn't necessarily had the big electrifying start to give like to say like, hey, this guy is really going good. Let's give him a shot and see if he can fill the second base void. They the prospect upper minors has not really given them anything to, you know, jump and ride and, and try to inject some excitement into their lineup. Uh, Zach Remillard, the 29 year old like road warrior minor leaguer, being the guy who's, who's basically served that purpose, kind of shows the paucity of their prospects really emerging up and, and giving them real major league options over the course of the season. I guess Colos would be that guy now, except he was right. plan A to start the season. So it doesn't really exactly. Count. And then, you know, his, <laughs> you know, they kind of did it reverse where he has, he's been solid in triple A, but flopped in the majors first so in a way that kind of kills the excitement a little bit of, Hey, there's our, one of our top prospects is doing pretty good in triple A. Yeah. I, I, we talked about that. We, I think it'd be worthwhile to bring back Colos, especially, uh, Watching Gavin Sheets play defense at uh, Angel Stadium this week. It's, uh, yeah, 
it might be worth the it might be worth to bring back Oscar Colas. But when it comes to the first half recap, the best position player for the White Sox of the first half, I think, is unanimous. I, I don't really think there's that much of a conversation. It's Luis Robert Jr. Currently on fan graphs, his war total is 3.3. Aaron Judge was selected to be an American League All-Star starter, but he has been dealing with this nagging toe injury. There's a lot of uncertainty if Aaron Judge is going to be able to go into the All-Star game. If he doesn't, that might give an opportunity for someone like Luis Robert, who will get maybe picked by Dusty Baker, to start in his place. We'll see. We don't have the full list of who would be the reserves yet, but the assumption is that Luis Robert will be on the American League All-Star team. The White Sox getting an All-Star because another team's outfielder crashed into a fence? Quite. The turn, <laughs> the table's a turn. <laughs> Well, you still got like a week of games left, so yeah, well, that's true. Uh, maybe don't put the cart before the horse, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Well, one question about Robert, though, like I think maybe the more interesting debate is like who is the second best position player? I'm Jake Berger. I think it would have to be one of the Andrews, right? Yeah, I, my. I mean, I think Vaughn is like always flirting with sub replacement because of defense, um, but he's probably Base been running. Yeah, uh, right. Being extremely slow, but like. He's he's been Andrew Vaughn, um, which we I think everyone is hoping to be more than like a 115 WRC plus guy, but that's also given the struggles they had to just have that level of stability. You, you can't spit on the W 115 WRC plus guy. Lyle yeah. Overbay. Yeah. Hey, we keep joking. He's Lyle Overbay. <laughs> hey, he had a triple today. It took Mike Trout to completely miss on a dive, but he got a triple and he scored off a wild pitch. So Fred Flintstone. Showing the wheels today. I only bring up Jake Berger because of the home runs. And when you do take a look at war, I think that power has allowed him to have a higher war than the Andrews right now. But I, I see your point, Jim, that it could either be Benatendi or Vaughn. And maybe even moving forward with, with Jake Berger's cold spell that it's probably going to be Benatendi or Vaughn behind Luis Robert at the end of this season. Yeah, um, Ben Intendi, I think, is just – he's disappointing because of, like, the home run total. But otherwise, he's been, as advertised, like, getting on base, playing okay defense that doesn't inspire a ton of confidence but is also way better than what the White Sox have run out there before. So, like, getting better by the, the low standards of the position. Um, yeah, it just – it's still the the most curious and unexciting way to give a franchise record contract. I think that's just always going to hang around him a little bit, being like, this was supposed to be the guy, or like, this was their idea of the guy, and he's just a guy. And But he it's... didn't know that. That that was the funny thing, yeah. right, James? Like, in his press conference, <laughs> Andrew Benatendi had no idea that he just signed the largest contract in White Sox history. They uh, they had this press conference on my wedding anniversary, so I, I think I read that, but I don't recall. <laughs> I would, didn't witness that. <laughs> I think he was like, he said like a little bit sheepishly, like, wow, yeah, hmm. <laughs> like, like his rancher wasn't like <laughs> flattered or honored. like, yeah, he's like, I'm, I, even he didn't think he was like worthy of that kind of title. So I, I've been hesitant to like put Andrew Benintendi up because like every time I talked to him, I was like, hey, how do you feel at the plate? He's like, bad. I was like, oh, all right. All right. <laughs> uh, 10 game hitting streak. Feeling better? No. I was like, oh. <laughs> Well, that's good to know. Uh, so the position player front, again, slam dunk, it's Luis Robert. There's some debate on who is the second best position player, but it is Robert, heads and shoulders above everybody else's the position player front. The best pitcher of the first half, I think could be an interesting debate. James, who would be your pick as the best pitcher for the White Sox of the first half? Uh, based on the idea that starters are more valuable than relievers, I think Giolito. I would agree. How about you, Jim? Would you go with Giolito? Giolito Cease is looking more like the guy he was, but Giolito has been that guy the whole season. So at least for, for the bulk of the season. So yeah, he gets the nod. What are your thoughts about Gregory Santos, James? Like, would he be the most valuable reliever for the White Sox? Because in some ways he's been like a godsend and helped really stabilize the bullpen. Uh, I see the case for it. Um, I feel like he's been like, I, I, like today, whether he pitched the eighth, I, I feel like that's probably he he'll get brought in for like this super high leverage sixth or seventh inning jam, but he's been a step below on the leverage ladder of like Graveman or, or Middleton. You haven't seen him come like B 
be the auxiliary guy for closers. So I want to give a little bit of like acknowledgement to that the fact that like, like his usage in innings are such that it almost cancels out the, the benefit, but I, I'm tempted to go um, to Graven or Middleton based on the fact like that they've been used in like higher leverage a bit. And I think Graven is like the old school vote in the sense of like, he's been just pitching nothing but high leverage and it's ugly and, well, peripherally, it's not like very pretty, but it's been like getting the job done in these moments where getting the job done is really all that matters. Whereas I think from a statistical perspective, Middleton's probably had the prettiest performance where it's this mixture of a really high ground ball rate, really high strikeout rate. So it looks super sustainable. And then Santos has just been giving you bulk effectiveness that outstrips both of them. So I, I don't think you can go wrong. I think in blending between the you know, in the clubhouse leverage matters fan point and my statistical leanings, I go in the middle of the road and go with Middleton. But I think, I think other beats would probably say Graveman. And I think if you're just adding up like the value and the contributions, you might say Santos. So I will go the Melky Toast route and pick Milton. Uh, <laughs> and not just because he uh, looked, made me, allowed me to look at his cologne collection. Yeah, that, that was an awesome article. Have you bought new cologne? After? I never bought a cologne in my life. I was absolutely swimming up a creek in that entire <laughs> Okay. Uh, Jim, question one, what's your favorite cologne brand? <laughs> Two, <laughs> who do you think is the best reliever for the White Sox in this first half? Yeah, I'm not a cologne guy either, so I got nothing for you there. But I am interested, like, when people are really interested in something niche, like, I'll go for that ride in the conversation. I'll ask questions. So, like, yeah, if he's really into it, like, yeah, I'd, why is is a fair question. But also, like, it would be an honest why and not, like, a snarky why. So, yeah, all, all for that. Um, like, I am want to lean towards Santos because he's my preseason breakout pick, uh, partially because of the lack of, like, breakout candidates on this roster. He was obscure enough to count. But I think like Graveman has justified the contract that Rick Hahn gave him in a way that Joe Kelly hasn't. Like when they signed Graveman, it was the idea that like, you know, if they needed a closer, you know, if Hendricks was out or unavailable or just overworked and they needed like a, a spare closer, they would go to him, you know, without reservation and feel like they were, you know, they, they could get by with him. And he's done that. Like it's not, you know, as James said, not pretty. Um, it often seems like, you know, he's kind of uh he went from being a ground ball guy to not being a ground ball guy. And he's doing okay with that. But also like, it just makes me wonder, like, does he know what his strength is anymore? And, and seems like he's, uh, make it up as he goes along effectively. But I just, yeah, I don't quite know his calling card is. And perhaps his calling card is just like sheer determination that allows him to uh, get by. Like, even if he's working the top of the zone more than he ever has, but you know, just looking at the way he's closed out games and, and he's had a couple of rough outings, but bounces back from them. He's been better, on consecutive days than he was last year when they had to be very delicate about that. Like Joe Kelly had that run of basically invincibility. And now he's back to being the mystery man, especially like in high leverage. He's, he's picked his worst outings for the worst possible situations. And he also had the, you know, IL stint early on the year that Graveman hasn't had. So Graveman's been available and he's been resilient to where like, even if he's not perfect, uh, the blips are blips. They're not uh, slumps. And I think that's, probably some of these bullpen needs because like, say if he did go into that like two week slump that like Aaron Bummer has had and Reynaldo Lopez has had, like could Middleton do that job the way Graveman has done it? Like, I don't think so. Not, no, you know, no offense to Middleton, but just, you know, I haven't seen enough of Middleton to think like he could be that guy because he's had his own burps, but they've been, you know, they have enough guys to cover for Middleton. Whereas with Graveman, I don't know if there's somebody who could cover for the job he's been doing. To, to jump off your point with Graveman, um, the way to wait to hear him tell it, he basically figured out how to throw pitches other than sinker, maybe like two, three years ago. And so he's been like adding on these things that they're like new features for him. So his fourth seamer isn't like good, but he's like figured out that if he's sinker heavy and he has that reputation, he can sneak one in and it'll get popped up. It's not like a bad missing four seamer, but he's noticed that like if he throws sinker, sinker, and he sneaks a four seamer and he's like his infield fly rate, I think is at a career high. And he, he mentioned like, yeah, I'm getting like kind of easy quick outs on that. And that's like, it kind of bails me out. So he's like, keeps adding things because there's these new toys that he's never had before. And he kind of inflates them in and they don't look pretty because he doesn't like have a, a strength that he rides, but he like, is able to throw people off with like adding like a, I think he threw a random curveball in today or stuff like that. It's Cause he's, he's kind of learned how to spin the ball late in his career. Hmm. That is, that's fascinating. 
Yeah, his walk his walk rates up, his strikeout rates down, so it kind of gives an you know air of desperation to it. But uh, it does help that like you know there is a uh, little bit of purpose to it in the sense that like oh I can do something I hadn't been able to do before, and let's screw up the scouting yeah. report. We'll see if he's still in the White Sox uh, after the trade deadline. The the best part about Santos and Middleton is that we were not expecting these guys to be part or factors of the White Sox bullpen at the beginning part of the season. And thankfully they have pitched really well for the White Sox to help stabilize where we don't know. It, there's a lot of uncertainty with Garrett Kershaw's injury. There's still some uncertainty with Liam Hendricks, even though he is starting to throw a baseball Aaron bummer. Who knows? Sometimes back-to-back games looks fantastic. Other times it's the same type of performances that make White Sox fans groan. And uh, my bre- breakout player, Jose Ruiz, is no longer with the team. Uh, side note on that. <laughs> yeah, but I that I, I do like those stories, though, as far as uh, with Gregory Santos and Keenan Middleton. Those are some positives out of the first half for the White Sox. We're going to take a quick break, but after a word from our sponsor, let's hand out grades for the White Sox first half, looking at the position player groups and the pitching groups and the coaching groups next on the Sox Machine Podcast. I'm sure many of you had this debate with significant others and friends about how fashionable cargo shorts are. As someone who has fought these battles and has been willing to die on the hill about the benefits of cargo shorts, I found a new light. In my attempts to get into more shape, I've lost a couple of pants short sizes, so it was time for a new wardrobe fix, and I discovered a apparel company called Bird Dogs. They make a wide range of gear, but they get high marks for their shorts. After receiving a pair, I understand the hype. Bird Dogs stretch khaki shorts have a slimmer fit, so it's more in line with today's fashion trends. It gives legs a sculpted look, but it's still a great fit around the waist, so I don't feel constricted. That's because bird dog shorts are not made with stiff, restricted cotton. Bird dogs invented a cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but it stretches to get you a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement, which is key for me. I want to look fashionable, but in a practical way. It's going to get hot in Chicago. I promise you. And if you are like me, wanting to up your shorts game, Check out Bird Dogs. Right now, they're running a special. When you make your order at birddogs.com, use promo code POOL at checkout to receive a free Yeti-style tumbler. Again, the URL is birddogs.com slash pool. Use promo code POOL at checkout for that gift. Welcome back to the Sox Machine Podcast. All right, so after talking about who we thought was the best position, position player the first half and the best pitchers of the first half, it's time to dish out our grades. And if you missed the first quarter episode where we handed out grades of the first quarter, uh, we'll start off with who doesn't deserve an F, Jim. Uh, <laughs> it was really easy in the first quarter to narrow that down because uh, so many people, so many groups deserved an F. So, James, I know you missed out on that episode. It's, it's a little bit of a joke. Uh, I think play has definitely picked up. Uh, In the second quarter for the Chicago White Sox, especially in May and June, as I mentioned, since May 1st, they are at or above 500. Uh, April was just so bad, it sunk everyone's first quarter grades. Uh, But the offensive grade, looking at the position players, Jim, how would you grade the White Sox offense in the first half? It's been like a D, D minus. I think they played themselves out of F territory, but like still looking at where the Fs are, it would be like Andrews, Anderson, Moncada, like those three and Moncada's partially injury. But if the White Sox turnaround or any improvement was uh, based on him being more available and better able to tap into his physical tools, like that was probably a misguided um, direction to go towards. So I would say, like, yeah, everybody else, Ben Intendi's on an upswing. Robert's been great. Sheets is kind of, uh, you know, like we said with Colas, like, it'd be a good time to go to Colas, I think, with the way Sheets has played, like, being kind of the replacement level bat, like, he profiled as before he had some random bursts of, like, looking good. Uh, Jimenez, like, he seems like he's getting there. It's just a matter of, like, will he have that one wrong step that puts him back on the injured list for three weeks, and then it's back to building him up again. So it's a little bit of, like, a uh, Sisyphus-type scenario with him. Like, every time it looks like he's about to be a world beater, uh, something grabs him, and he's back down. So I think when he gets the Fs, you're looking at, like, Andrews Anderson, Makata, 
probably Sebi, although with the... Hey, now, he's <laughs> on his way to 10 home runs. Yeah, multi-homer outburst, like it's there, but just, uh, I think Sebi just... Grandal is having the season I think you expect to have from Grandal in the fourth year of a contract for a 30-year, yeah, a catcher in his 30s. Like, he was supposed to fade out by the end of his contract. He's fading out, but, like, still making himself useful here and there. I think the idea was to have somebody come in and supplement him to, you know, not uh, have to lean on uh, a 34-year-old catcher uh, doing the bulk of the lifting, and Sebi has not really done that. Like, it doesn't help that, like, he has a really hard job in that, like, the... <laughs> Just saw seeing Berger crash into him again. Like I, I want having seen like heard Hawk Harrelson praise Paul Canerco for how well he catches pop-ups and thinking like that is the faintest of praise. And then watching like Andrew Vaughn and Jake Berger crash into Sebi Zavala over and over again because they don't call for pop-ups or don't get there in time. Uh made me think like, oh, you know, Hawk there was something to Hawk saying that, having seen replacement level pop-up management <laughs> in the infield. So <laughs> I, I think with that in mind, like just Sebi is like He's got a tough job. He's got a tough hand, but also like he could do more than uh, well, now his OPS starts at the five. So at least he's there. There's an upswing, but for the first half, it wasn't. So yeah, I think that's where I'm at. For a game, he was ahead of Tim Anderson in the season OPS. I don't think that's the case now after Thursday's game. Uh, James, what grade would you give the White Sox offense in the first half? Uh, I'm going to get in trouble again. Um <laughs> <laughs> Did you get in trouble with your first quarter grades? Because you were just as harsh as we were. Uh, first quarter, I didn't. Don't think I. More was thinking the last time I gave out a, a notable. Oh, the off season. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, for what the team needed, for how it's built, knowing that there was gonna not gonna be good defensively or great defensively, and knowing that like the starters have. Like they need to be a team to bash the baseball. They were not a team. They're not like the Guardians. They're not built to be the 25th best offense by WRC plus. So for them to be that below expectations and be such a big fueling part of where they are, I mean, I think it's a failing grade. Like their expectations are high. They talked about playoffs and contention, and they're 11 under because they can't hit consistently, and they're. It's a daily battle to like get people on base. I, I I don't think it's it's passing. I'm not like condemning them to hell <laughs> as a result. Uh, but I, uh, it's it's a there's this team is like there's a lot of sacrifices on the diamond to get offense out of this unit. So for them to be subpar, um, you know, markedly, not even just average. I, I don't think it's a passing grade. I think it's, which I think is an F. Yeah. It's, it's tough just because like, it's an F with like Luis Roberts, what's keeping me from giving an F, but then you think like Luis Roberts doing this way he's doing and they're still this bad. So maybe they are an F. Mm. Yeah. Like the, the most important player and basically the team is like breaking out and <laughs> which like, that was the most important task to get Luis Robert healthy and up and running and delivering on his potential. And you achieved it, but also how is everything else? It's so bad that, you know, it's dragging this down. Uh, yeah, that is, that's, that's a mind puzzle that I'll be unpacking for the rest of the night. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's go over to the pitching side. I, well, how I about think, you, Josh? Well, well I, you? Any, any uh, quibbles? Listening to, listening to both of you. I, Jim, I also had a D minus because of Luis Robert. But the point that you make, and James's point as well, like, I mean, we're pulling straws here, like really thin straws, and the difference between a D minus and an F for the White Sox. But James makes a, makes a really good point. Like, this is a team that had playoff expectations coming into this season, and here they are, like, whatever metric you want to use, weighted runs create a plus. If you just want to use Team OPS, they're still 25th in Major League Baseball, and it starts with a six. With their team OPS, that's not good enough, especially when you're at home at Guarantee Ray Field. And we've been talking about this for years, Jim, that they're not taking advantage of the ballpark that they play in. And it really does seem like with this offense that they can't sustain what they did in the last two days in Anaheim, that it's please, Luis Roberts, save us. Or let's have a random Jake Berger home run. And that's not an efficient offense. And I'm starting to see it in the comments section at Sox Machine, Jim where some people are referring like this feels like the 2015 White Sox. And I agree with them. It does have a very familiar feel as the 2015 White Sox in which the pitching staff is in rhythm and they are getting better 
and they're getting to the middle of the pack of Major League Baseball after being one of the worst after the month of April. But man, this offense is like too, it's leaning too heavily on like Luis Robert for sure. It's probably going to lean too heavily on Andrew Benatendi and Andrew Vaughn in the near future. So it would be, I think Melky would be a good comp for Benintendi because Melky got off to a terrible start that oh, year. And then by the time he salvages numbers, it was too late. And uh, yeah, Benintendi plays better defense, but also in like not difference making defense to where like he can make up for one homer. So yeah, I mean, yeah, and of course, at Robert now. would be Jose Abreu in 2015. Yep. And then Vaughn would be Eaton probably in terms of just like the secondary contribution, which is, you know, except... Eden was at the top of the order, but yeah, just looking at the same OBP problems like uh, 295 from Flowers, 268 from Yolmer, 285 from Lexi, 267 from Saladino. I mean, those fit right in with the 2023 roster. And the whole point of the rebuild was not having that <laughs> during the contention window. And here we are. We're back to 2015. They, they made JB Shuck look good. Oh, man. Memories. I, I have the pennant right up there. JB shucks on it. <laughs> Players that we survived during the White Sox rebuild for this contention window. Uh, so the offense, even though the last two days have been good, let's see if the good vibes keep going. But for the most part of the season, they have been failing. And I think everybody could agree that they have been failing. On the pitching side, though, I think this union has gotten a lot better. I know they currently rank 22nd in Major League Baseball when it comes to team ERA, but if you look at the staff ERAs of where the White Sox are grouped, these are teams all the way from ranked 15th through 25th. So they're, if you create this in the bell curve, I feel like they are in that C territory that they have pitched themselves out of the F ranking and gained a couple grades, uh, especially in the second quarter of the season. At one point, they were one of the best pitching staffs, especially in May when they got hot with both the starting unit and the bullpen. So I think I would give the White Sox pitching a C. James, how do you feel about the White Sox pitching staff for the first half? What grade would you give them? I mean, entering today was a 99 ERA plus. Um, I think they've legitimately been great in the second half or, you know, the last whatever like the figure they flashed in the broadcast like the other night, which was like, they've been the best ERA since like the middle of May. Um, Second quarter. Yeah. That's awesome. But um, it, it like, if you're asking me like everything looks peachy now because you're not watching Jose Ruiz or Jake Diekman or uh, you know, even, even Lambert, I, I thought he pitched probably decently for most of April, but then would have a blow up out and it ruined the stats. Like, I feel like maybe Bummer is probably the one person who's around um, who's, who's really kind of still his numbers really bare or still, you know, as hideous as things probably were in, in April, even though like his talent level shows that like, you know, have these outings where he looks dominant, but it's tempting to give him a better grade because like who's still around and who survived is, um, you know, reflective of, you know, kind of the turnover that's bad, but like the results we're talking about the full Hurst half, I, I think it's like a C plus because yeah, things are just so ugly and that's such a big part of the hole that they're, they're not really suited to dig out of that. You can't really give it a much rosier outlook than that. How about you, Jim? Yeah, I, I'm going with the C. Like if he asked me like maybe like a week or two ago, I might've been inclined to get maybe going to B minus, but like with Kopech slipping, um, it makes me like looking at the rotation, they were on pace for like four guys with three wins of a replacement. And then like Lance Lynn doing like the thankless work of like post-surgery John Danks to where like he's overpaid uh, for what he's doing, but he's also like throwing five or six innings, which not everybody can do. So he's going to be like the worst qualified starter in baseball, but he's saving the bullpen one or two innings a night. And like, as we saw uh, with the finale in the angel series, like, he does give your team a win if you have an uh, give your team a chance to win if your offense is you know capable of having a breakout game. Like he keeps games within reach even though he gets off to terrible starts. So like when you have uh, three or four three war guys and like the bad guy is throwing 180 innings, that should be a pretty good rotation and pretty enviable. Except you know Clevenger is out until at least the uh, All Star break, and Kopech is a little bit of mystery, and Lynn's still you know having big problems against lefties. So that kind of slips it back into C territory because like I can see having like a start to the third quarter of the season that makes me think like, wow, I gave this 
pitching staff a B just because of they're now they're down to counting on Jesse Schultons versus having uh, him be a pleasant surprise who like crosses the day off the calendar, but also gets them a win. Um, it's going to be a lot trickier now, I think, going into the third quarter. So I want to uh, check my enthusiasm and keep them solidly C. If the offense was a C with this pitching staff that we across the board gave the White Sox a C, James gave them a C plus, this team's probably leading the division with how bad the division is. Like that's that makes me a little sad. And that brings the coaching staff, specifically Pedro Grafal in his first half as manager. Uh, Jim, we had this episode not that long ago and on how we were both kind of out on Pedro Grafal. Uh, has anything changed in the last couple of weeks? Do you, do you have a, a firm idea what kind of grade you would give him in his first half of his managerial career? Yeah, I'm, I'm still out on him. Um, there are some signs of progress, um, especially with the bullpen, ironing that out a little bit. You know, As James mentioned, um, figuring out who are his better guys are getting away from Reynaldo Lopez in every single high leverage situation and the rotations made it a little bit easier on him too to simplify things. There still are some, some tendencies that I just think get him in trouble. Like the defensive subs or the pinch hitting sprees. He goes on like in the sixth and seventh innings that empty his bench out and leave him with no moves in the ninth. Like he, I think he has a tendency to always look for the best case scenario working out to where like if we get this pinch hit and tie the game we'll be in great shape in the ninth inning and then like they don't get that hit and now they're screwed uh same thing with like yeah i think he saw the best in lopez and bummer for a while and didn't get those results so i think he still you know there's there's nothing about his personality that screams optimist i mean i guess in a way like he praises everybody so there's that but like his demeanor uh the way he carries himself he really doesn't have a personality like he's aggressively uninteresting and, and continues to be like he's given like James can probably speak to this better, but I think if James could relay something about the man, he probably would have in his reporting, but it's been like all baseball and the baseball hasn't been good. So he's tied himself entirely to bad baseball, but yeah, I just, I don't see a difference maker here. So if like a new general manager came in and said like, Griffal, you're out, like be like, yeah, good. Like, fine. It's, you know, no, you know, no offense to him, but also like, I don't have a grasp of the person to really feel like, you know, I'm invested in him as an individual because he hasn't made himself really an individual. Yeah. James, as you jump on here, uh, Jim and I are really out on Pedro Grafal. Uh, I would give Grafal an F. Uh, he was brought in to try to make sure the core got back to what they were supposed to be expected playing level. Uh, he got one, to do that, Luis Robert, uh, everybody else has not been able to do that. And this team has taken a step back from the 2022 season. So uh, in that sense, uh, he is failing in that regard in the first half. Uh, what are your thoughts on Grafal in, in his first half of his managerial career, James? Uh, he, well, he called me when I got laid off, so he gets an A. Um, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. He seems <laughs> fine. <laughs> He's seems, something about the individual. He seems fine. Uh, like his explanations, like they're not like, oh, I agree with them, but they're not like, what? What happened here? Um, like his, he's kind of got this, you know, you know, over eagerness to make moves or use his bench or make defensive replacements. Um, but that came in right after Tony, who was like kind of obstinate about like, well, if I made the lineup, I thought they were the best outfit and you'd, you'd see him like kind of slow to use any pinch hit options. Um, or, you know, as the you know legend grows, literally yelling at him to put an angle to pinch run as opposed to like doing it kind of automatically. <laughs> uh, it, it, so it, it seemed almost like, um, you know, the flip side of that, of, you know, the, the constant opposite manager of, you know, the counterbalance or whatever you just had. But as much as, however, I think his explanations tend to be, you know, at least rooted in logic or have a consistent, like, you know, through line of what he's thinking or what he's going for, even if, you know, as I think Jim has noted, he tends to wind up having defensive replacements hitting for themselves a lot, uh, usually in high leverage situations after they've been, their defensive benefit has been rendered moot um, or the fact that he's kind of the go down with the ship with my guys type where he's going to be, you know, saying Tim Anderson's going to turn around at some point in September, maybe, um, or, you know, <laughs> took forever to kind of pivot away from Ronaldo Lopez. 
there there's a, theoretically a season where that sort of consistency those guys do find it and they turn around and they say like hey it was great that pedro never gave up on us like to, to some degrees i wonder how much he's just been given a bad hand uh, but at the end of the day none of the things that he wanted like the plate discipline that he's harped on the defensive communication all the, all the things that are supposed to get sharper under him as much as i might like him interpersonally or you know think you know his press conferences are you know, I, I found them bad. I, I know like some of the stuff about his life that I wasn't there for has come off as stubborn and stuff like that. As much as I might think that plus plus only sound, the things that the team was supposed to improve upon under him, the way they're supposed to be more detail oriented, the way they were supposed to have a more rigid plan on offense, the results just aren't there. So if I wanted to give him a positive grade, I don't have like the hard cold things to base it off of. So I don't, I'm not out on him in the way like where he's off putting to me, or I think like this guy is, None of nothing what he says makes sense, but you can't point to the results that everyone ties to the manager of them just playing sharper baseball or them, you know, having a consistent plate approach or, um, you know, I, I think some of the times they've gotten burned bringing guys out for, you know, it's a fan thing of when a guy's rolling, they want to bring him out for a second inning, but I think he's gotten burned a little bit on that uh, a lot. Um, so I, I just can't point to this positive, like, Hey, it's working. So that's why I can base on it. So I, I probably can't go much higher than, you know, C, C minus. Uh, and I, because the team has failed, the team has flopped, the performance has been bad. It's been worse than last year. All their problems have either kind of stagnated or gotten worse. So I talked to a lot of his coaching staff, like Chris Johnson, I think will articulate their problems as well as anybody. And, talk about these you know simulated bats they're doing to literally map out these pitch decisions that they're supposed to be working on getting better at and it sounds very convincing i, I it's all as like convincing as when i interviewed in the off season and he said like we're not up there to hit singles uh but the results aren't there the you know the, the improved play discipline aren't there could it turn around over the course of the season could it get better could it, you know, this work pay off long run? Could it possibly take it be a four or five month process to really have these, you know, this have the eye pitch pay off? Maybe, but right now I can't give you a good grade when you're doing all the things just as bad as it was last season. So I, I want to say like, I like the guy. I, I like talking to him. He seems like a sound baseball mind, but the team is bad. So I don't see minus. It, do you know why there's a disconnect? Because to your point, James, they say the right things when they're talking about like Pedro Grafal. We have to hit the ball in the air. We got to stop hitting the ball on the ground. That warms my heart. We got to hit more home runs. That warms my heart. In those interviews that you've had with Chris Johnson, like I agree with you, James, that makes a lot of sense. Like the coaching staff knows and they're trying to work on these things with the players but what's the disconnect here? Like, it's obvious that they have the knowledge and they have good ideas, but those good ideas are not coming. They're not transforming to good results on the field consistently. So um, now that I'm at the Sun Times, I can be edgier. Uh, the, the traditional <laughs> journalism lesson is like when somebody is like testifying to something, what they're willing to concede that doesn't you know lead to their point is what your real takeaway is. So when Pedro Gafol was saying last weekend, like Lewis Robert has really bought into like the eye pitch and the simulated stuff. Uh, what did he, what was really kind of maybe jumping out as your iron cold takeaway is that him saying like the buy-in was slow, which makes you indicate like, yeah, this is not something that maybe the entire group or him or others were kind of really latching onto in April when things were really dark. I mean, when I was first trying to really say who was responding to that story or who's responding to that stuff, um, early in the season, it was probably more guys like Berger, Sheets, Vaughn, and that trio that works together and hits together all the time. I think Romy Gonzalez is part of that group. So obviously he's, his April is not really a big testimony to its efficacy. When I first talked to Tim Anderson about that machine early in the season, he was like, yeah, I'll do it, but it, it just seems like another machine. It doesn't seem revelatory to me. Now, I think reading Daryl's story over this week, now that he's really struggling. He's probably diving into that a little bit more and Maybe, you know, as they've since they've made those sessions and those simulated and, you know, at bats and their sessions in the lab before they go outside for their normal uh, batting practice kind of mandated. Maybe that Louis Roberts taking part in that bit more, but you're still not seeing the kind of team wide effect 
uh, for everything. I mean, Sebi, as much as we thought last season was, you know, not, you know, it was going to be hard to maintain that. I think it was a 400 bad bit. I think we probably all expected him to be somebody who could maintain maybe a 70 or 80 WRC plus just based on power. Cause he had a really good spring training and he showed power uh, throughout his career and um, you know, certainly in spring training. Um, so the fact that he struggled to where he was, you know, has to have a multi home run game to bit after the 40. I think even that's part of the, the underperformance uh, that gets underplayed. Like the having a guy who's a W an 80 WRC plus getting, you know, 150 at bats too, just an automatic out. That's a big difference. Um, having Elvis Andrews floating around 80 to as opposed to like 50 WRC plus, that's a big difference. So the way that these guys have really bottomed out, um, it, it, it's, it's killing the team as much as maybe Eloy Menes not breaking out into the MVP level bat that they wanted. So the fact that like this team wide approach is not taken on, uh, I don't know. It's, it's kind of a black mark that puts hangs over everything. Even when, you know, you feel like you're hearing stuff that you haven't heard before in white Sox dumb, it, it doesn't seem like it's keeping pace to the rest of the league in the way that, you know, we anticipate this great leading forward. So I don't know Jim, if I came around what, to a point, but yeah, I don't know. No, no, no. Love I, I think, is what I have. Yeah. I mean, it, I think you answered the question that I had. I think you painted a good enough picture to understand on some players jumped on quickly. Some did not. And that's up to the coaching staff to try to get as much buy-in as possible. And that was kind of the fear that when you hire a manager with no manager experience and you're walking in behind Tony the Russa, who's a hall of famer, how quickly can you mesh with the players of the clubhouse? And it's taken a little bit longer with everybody than we were expecting. But Jim, before we preview the series against the Oakland A's, what is the most pressing pressing question that you have about the White Sox going into the second half? Well, I think, you know, well, real quick to go back to a point James made about like Chris Johnson articulating things well, like part of me one you know wonders if we should even be grading the coaching staff because like after now three administrations with this core and not getting what they wanted out of it, um, you know, should we be looking at the front office? Should, you know, any coaching grade reflect on the front office ability to evaluate their own talent and make changes where they're necessary versus like hoping they'll coach their way out of it? Because like, you know, Griffal kind of had the same thing underlying his hiring process was like he, he identified why we suck. And same thing with Chris Johnson's thing. He's saying all the right things. He's saying things we weren't doing before and just like, yeah, but it's still the same players who might do the same thing again, regardless of what you tell them. So like if they're hiring guys because they're good at pointing out why they were bad in 2022, like we could have gotten hired for that job. We could have said like, hey, Rick, uh, they're hitting too many ground balls and, and uh, you know, they're just they're defensively poor and they don't have a strength. Yeah, uh, like the new coaching staff is kind of like a control sample, like. All right, now we've rolled into like a new group from another organization, and this they have the none of these guys created these problems. Like, so now, like the the next line of like logical deduction is it's the players that because you brought in a whole new guys and they're still doing the same thing. Yeah, I think Jake Diekman might be like the one you know variable that works against that, and just going to a different organization, being like, oh, you're throwing four seamers now, and uh, kind of ditching the uh, you know sinker sweeper thing, and you. Know, finding a new gear, but I also wonder if like Ethan Katz is overburdened is like the one guy who understands concepts, like at the higher level, you know, coming in from Don Cooper and being like, you're going to be a Don Cooper figure, but also we're not going to supplement you with like a raise type front office that really just takes a lot of the identification, you know, away from, like basically like the breakout guys they got like Santos and Milton, they were guys he'd work with. Clevenger was a guy he worked with and just, it seems like they could probably lighten his load by, having guys in the front office who, you know, more bodies in the front office to identify players who are promising that cats doesn't have firsthand experience with. I don't know if that's correct me if I'm wrong or, you know, off or misguided on that, James. Uh, yeah, I would say it's a lot on Ethan. I think probably the big gets, of, I mean, I think the, the premise of like an article I wrote right before the Clevenger news drop is like their big three, all their pitching additions are just former Ethan guys. So, and those have been, um, I guess kind of the big finds in terms of the bullpen uh, have been guys that he worked with in the past. Um, I One, like, I think he's a good pitching coach. I don't think he's like an immortal pitching coach who has this perfect touch. And I think probably at Don Cooper's height, uh, even when he was like obviously a really good pitching coach, the White Sox leaned on that too much and had him kind of trying to 
turn five bargain bin signings into into gold instead of just one or two per off season. So I, I think there's probably a little continuation of that. You obviously want someone like Ethan who is as insightful as been good as him to be involved, but you're also looking at a point where there's not really big revelations beyond, you know, some guys that he worked well with in the angels and giant system already. But to, uh, to go to your original question, Josh, about like most pressing question, like, I think it would have to be starting pitching because if you can't count on this offense sustaining on base percentage and not, you know, aside from these odd games where they do have 10 plus hits and hit, you know, three plus homers to, you know, have some big innings, then I think the strength is that pitching rotation. But if Clevenger is uncertain and Kopech is in this murky area, uh, and Lance Lynn is just being the guy who delivers five ugly innings uh, or six ugly innings sometimes, like that's not really a strength you can lean on. So, you know, can they get enough, you know, from Cease and Giolito, but also can they get what they're getting from Kopech and Clevenger spots before like the last couple weeks of the quarter? So looking at that, uh, you know, that's probably the most pressing question if this team remains intact. I think, you know, hovering over everything is do they sell and tear it down or sell off parts? And then, like, what are they left with? And, you know, are they just going to be rebuildy for the rest of the season? Yeah, that's my most pressing question is what they're going to be doing on August 1st. Because uh, if they sell, uh, this team could get a lot worse. And then we're talking about a White Sox team that is uh, purposely trying to catch up to Kansas City to improve their draft lottery odds of getting to a top five pick in the 2024 Major League Baseball draft. But James, what's the most pressing question for you for the White Sox going into the second half? Uh, I mean, I guess you, now that you pointed out um, the fact that their rotation could be, you know, is Lynn can fixable is Michael Kopech, you know, in this mid like mid season kind of slow down as far as any loads. And, you know, when do you get Mike Clevenger back and do you sell the deadline? I mean, everything else seems quaint compared to those two. Um, yeah. I would say what is salvageable offensively? Like, you know, I, they're kind of going to ride Tim Anderson until the bitter end. So that's, that's probably a very central thing as far as turning around, especially their on base profile. Not that he's, you know, a, a, a serial walk taker, but, um, he, he's someone that they counted on to be, a, you know, clearly 340 plus, um, at kind of at the minimum, uh, OBP guy. Um, obviously, if Eloy and Men is, is healthy, that's that's still probably an area of potential gain, um, to some degree. And so that that's probably a big part of, of what they have to do. But, um, I, I, I can't imagine really looking at the Yamankata situation and expecting, like, hey, just you know, three more weeks of rest and we get the guy from early April again, that, that seems kind of sailed. And so if that's the case and you just stick burger at third base and most of you should be able to DH Eloy uh, as much as possible uh, to keep him healthy enough. Right. And I, I, I think that's him and him and Tim Anderson are probably your big potential for, you know, offensive upside for an offense that really does not have much consistency day to day. So um, since the, the real two pressing questions are taken, I think keeping LA healthy or getting e- Tim healthy or, or, you know, at least functioning to, to what he can be, um, no, not knowing whether his knee is going to be really hundred percent for the rest of the year or, or, or other pressing things to fix what really ails them, which is getting on base. Can I depress everybody here and just ask if Yohan Mankata is Brent Morrell for like the rest of the season, like just in terms of how you have to consider him and what he can offer? I mean, it just the the scenario was laid out was that like it's a ninety percent chance that he doesn't need surgery, but that was premised on the idea that if he rests, it will get better and it'll basically go away. But he clearly rested and he came back to action, and it you know bothered him again, and it was kind of something that was still kind of bothering him here and there. Um, you know, even in moments while he was playing, and even being like you know somewhat, I guess, productive at least playing good defense. Uh, so without having any inside intelligence or seeing any like scans, like it doesn't lend a lot of confidence, the idea that he doesn't need surgical mediation or at least some sort of like procedure to address this in a more long-term fashion. So if that's the case, a 28 year old who needs back surgery or has had the last two seasons kind of banged with injuries, that doesn't lead a lot of confidence to what his long-term picture is and certainly doesn't make 
leads you to the idea of like them picking up his team options uh, after next season. So um, as far as just like a very murky picture because of back problems, yeah, I think that part of the comparison works. Obviously, Brent Morrell was in the you know a number one global prospect at any point or after that sort of <laughs> ceiling, but um, he was someone we got excited about having like a 350 OBP in Charlotte. Uh, so I remember those days. Well, we're going to take a quick break for one more word from our sponsors. But coming up next, we preview the White Sox next series as they visit the athletics in Oakland. One reason why I hate buying tickets to anything these days is the waiting room. You know that feeling. You get the pre-sale code, and even if you got the pre-sale code and you log in, you're stuck in the waiting room with thousands of other people, not even sure if you're going to get a chance to buy tickets. Buying tickets to any event shouldn't be stressful and that's why I've switched and used game time. It's the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater shows near you. I use it to buy concert and theater tickets now for Chicago events. You could use it. It's also great for Major League Baseball games as well. They have some killer deals, especially when it comes to White Sox tickets as game time is the place for last minute ticket deals. Forget planning months in advance. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event, and you can get exclusive flash deals on tickets for the baseball games or any of the comedy and theater shows that'll be happening all summer long in Chicago. And what I really like about Game Time is that they have the Game Time guarantee, which means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. That's why it's one of the fastest growing ticketing apps in the country for a reason. So snag the tickets without stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app on your phone, either for Apple or Android devices, create an account, and use promo code SOCKSMACHINE for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account on Game Time and redeem code SOCKSMACHINE for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. Welcome back to the Sox Machine Podcast. Now we preview the White Sox next series as they start off the second half against the Oakland Athletics in Oakland. And the A's just got perfect game by the New York Yankees. They're currently 21 and 62 on the season. That's the worst record in Major League Baseball. They're currently 29 games back of the Texas Rangers in the American League West, but I don't think ownership really cares about that. In the last 10 games, the Athletics are 2-8 and eight. at home this year. They're 10-31 and 31 when they play night games. The A's are 17-30. When they play in the day, they're 4-32. and 32. How about that as a stat? And in one-run games this year for the A's, they are 13-16. and 16. And when it comes to the offensive pitching, you can just scroll straight to the bottom and you'll find Oakland when it comes to offensive stats and pitching stats. The pitching problems for this series is interesting. The biggest storyline for the White Sox coming into this weekend, Friday night at 8.40 p.m. Central Time, it's to be determined for the White Sox as that's going to be a bullpen game against Luis Medina of the Oakland Athletics, who currently has a 6.84 ERA. On Saturday at 3.07 p.m. Central Time, it'll be Dylan Cease making the start for the White Sox against James Caprillion. And then on Sunday at 3.07 p.m. Central Time, this was supposed to be Michael Kopech's spot, but it sounds like the White Sox could be pushing Michael Kopech back and try to give him more rest. Paul Blackbird will be making the start for the Athletics. And when it comes to Michael Kopech's workload management, if this feels like deja vu, listeners, yes, Jim and I have just recently talked about Michael Kopech's workload management on Monday's podcast. But James, we were talking about the article that you wrote in the Chicago Sun-Times that Ethan Katz was highlighting the fact that they wanted to give Kopech more rest. Here, it's his, it's his spot in the rotation on Sunday. Sounds like the White Sox are going to push him back. I feel like he could Kopech could use that start on Sunday to get back on track, at least a confidence boost to face the worst team in Major League Baseball. What's the thinking here from the White Sox when you got a chance to talk to them last in, in the last homestand regarding Michael Kopech and this workload management? So, and doubling back to the whole idea of like what someone is willing to concede while they're arguing their point being the real takeaway. Like at the time, and I had it like, you know, basically talked to the team in a week and I just went up to Michael and said, how are you feeling? And I was like, oh, your velocity has been pretty good. And he was like arguing mostly on the fact that like, I don't want a break. I feel, I want to compete. I want to pitch, but he'd say like, but I am feeling pretty tired. Like I have been dealing with this. So I, 
he was acknowledging that there is fatigue present. And while that's normal for pitchers, especially right for the all-star break to kind of be like, yeah, I'm wearing out, um, you know, the break's coming at a good time, stuff like that. I mean, a bit of a wall is kind of the longest stretch of sustained pitching because the second half is shorter. Um, it seemed like he was conceding a little bit that he is feeling and noticing fatigue that it seems like now the team is responding to with these like extra breaks uh, that are giving him. Like he is going to probably pretty easily clear his major league high in innings and, you know, his professional high would be higher, but it'd be like pre TJ surgery at this point in his career. So I think there's, they were already planning to make him kind of the last starter out of the break. I'm sure they will still do that. Um, you know, Ethan said they were planning on doing that when I talked to him this weekend. Um, so the fact that these kind of they're further responding makes it sound like he's not bouncing back after bullpens or outings in a way that maybe he was able to do in May, unless they're maybe responding that by doing extra bullpen days. They kind of have three long guys right now with uh Tuki Jasant, Tanner Banks, and, and Jesse Shelton. It's not exactly like you know, a luxury of riches, but it makes them probably makes it a little bit easier for them to figure out like how do we get two games out of these combined three dudes if you know Jesse Schultons is pretty much fully stretched out and you know we can piece it together between Tanner Banks and Tassant, uh, you know, maybe another day, especially against an offense that was league average for one point this year and now is down to an 86 WRC plus. So I led to believe they've probably been not very good of recent. Um yes, I know I'm talking about the team that got perfect games. So that's obvious point but it, it <laughs> seems like they've maybe taken a, a further step down from even where they were you know a month ago is it because it's the a's is that why the white Sox are willing to have two bullpen days james i think it's mostly responding to where Kopech is at i think like you can't say like hey you're tired but you we're facing the rangers so uh go throw your arm off i don't think they can necessarily be your policy but maybe there's a, a slight bit of like hey there's this is not an awful time to do that Got it. Okay. Uh, Jim, then how do you think this could play out? Should we, are we going to see like the Tanner Banks, Jesse Schultons duo on Friday? And then I guess, I mean, Tuki Tuason has been pitching well for the White Sox. Maybe you give him a chance to start on Sunday. Yeah, I think, you know, probably Tucson can fill that Tanner Banks role into like count on three-ish innings. But if the pitch counts on his side, like he's used to getting up and down to where like, yeah, go a fourth inning, go a fifth inning. And who knows, like with the way like Herman uh, cut through them, like maybe there's a case that banks can go five against this offense to where like against, uh, you know, better offenses uh, that they've seen this month, you're, you're hoping for three at most. So I think that's why it makes sense to gamble here with a bullpen game is because like they might not resemble bullpen games. If you get one of those stereotypical A's performances to where, Either they just don't have the offense or the offense they do have is mostly checked out because of just how the season's gone, which I think they've looked at uh, in some stretches. So I, I think that's why it makes sense. Like one thought I had was like, if they were worried about Kopech a little bit or didn't want to like tax him, like, could they throw him into the bullpen mix? Could they have him say like, oh, you're only going two innings and you know, you're not going to be the bulk guy for this game. We're going to have you start, go through your normal procedure, but only have two innings to go through. And then we'll go to Tanner Banks as a lefty switch up or something like that. But probably, you know, makes sense to go to the bullpen and just, you know, if it's looking great through four, then you didn't need Kopech anyway. You know, hopefully I think it counts on Cease delivering in the middle game. So I think there's a lot of pressure on him to uphold the order of the bullpen. Cause if he has one of his, uh, you know, occasional control lapse outings to where he throws a hundred pitches over four innings. And now you have to cover five innings during his start. And you already had to cover eight to nine innings in the game surrounding him. Then I think that's where it might get a little bit too cute. But yeah, if Kopech, if you're talking about like Kopech going could really throw him off physically. And as we talked about, you need to have Kopech in the mix for a lot of the second half. If they're going to make any sort of run, then probably, you know, it makes sense to be safe. And hopefully, you know, as good as a sweep would be and as needed as a sweep would be, you probably can't sell out for it, given just how the division has gotten away from them. <laughs> the division is still the number to chase and not how many games under 500 they are. So if they can stay within five games of first place, uh, then they could probably try to get too cute with this series just because if it cost Kopech starts down the line starting him now then it wouldn't have made much sense in hindsight yeah Minnesota's at Baltimore this weekend that's a tough series for the twins who just got swept by the Atlanta Braves 
earlier this week, Cleveland is facing the Chicago Cubs this weekend. So we'll see if the Northsiders could help out the Southsiders. But Jim brought up Dylan Cease, James. And I thought Dylan Cease pitched well against the Angels Tuesday night. And I like the way that he went about his business. It just... I think he's most effective if he just simply attacks the opposing team. I know that there's always a question of how teams are going to battle against Dylan Cease. Are they going to be aggressive on me and swing early in the count, or are they just going to wait back on me? And I think when you look at just like the percentages of pitches that he's throwing, especially the breaking pitches into the strike zone, before this month, it seemed like he was aiming for the edges too often and he would have strike percentages in like the 40s high 30s with his slider against the angels he pitched with i think minimal fear and yeah shohei otani burned him i mean who didn't get burned by otani this season for the white Sox pitching staff but i thought he did an excellent job just coming straight forward and attacking the angels and against this oakland athletics team that's the type of dylan cease that i'd like to see and to Jim's point, I think it's imperative that Cease has to go at least six innings, right? Um, yeah, especially you know for the bullpen um, requirements that you have for the other two games, I think it's imperative. I mean, I, Dylan will tell you that he's always just trying to pour his stuff in the zone and get ahead, and you know then earn chases from there. I think it, he's not necessarily a guy who would talk about avoiding or pitching around people um as maybe to a fault uh, if you ask uh Savala after the one hitter um I think he wanted him to bounce that slider to Luis Arias uh, but uh I, for me I see the largely thing as mechanical of just the the shoulder opening up thing that kind of made him you know spray wildly uh you know persistently throughout the middle two months of the season um I, I think whenever you have a story where it said uh you know, he's been really looking at his biomechanics and kind of examining to what's going wrong and what physically he was doing that uh, throughout the season in a way he never has before. The, you know, follow question was, why has he never done that before? Why are you not, you know, checking his biomechanics and doing those sort of reviews all the time? It's just the, the way he was rolling last season. He never really had to, uh, but it's, it's been a very gradual process. And, I, you know, he felt he was probably around 75% of the way there maybe last month. And now it feels at least probably made a little, a little bit closer to 90. I don't think we've seen maybe that dominant, you know, flirting with double digit strikeouts every time out and really uh, commanding and pounding the zone guy that we saw in great stretches last season. Though obviously he doesn't get to face the AL Central quite as often as he did last year. But I think we're as close to it opening day Dylan Cease as we've ever been these last two times out. So that's definitely promising going into the break. Yeah, as he entered the month of June, Dylan Cease had a season ERA of 4.88. It has dropped to 4.04. In the month of June, Dylan Cease had a 2.20 ERA for the Chicago White Sox, spanning five starts, covering 28 and two-thirds innings with 42 strikeouts and 10 walks. Hopefully he could carry that into the month of July as his start will kick off the July month for the Chicago White Sox. It's a big month for the White Sox. Again, they have three games against the Oakland Athletics. They come home. They have three games against the Toronto Blue Jays. I don't know what to make of next weekend series at home against the St. Louis Cardinals because that team has not been playing very well. And then it's the All-Star break, and the White Sox get four days off before they have to pack their bags and go visit the Atlanta Braves, which will not be an easy series and an easy way to start the post-All-Star break for the White Sox. But that's the next couple of weeks for the Chicago White Sox. And again, they're still just four and a half games back. So a big weekend against Oakland. The Twins trip up here again against Baltimore. Maybe the Cubs can help out the White Sox and win their series against the Guardians. And all of a sudden, a Monday's podcast, we're a little bit more hopeful, even though the White Sox would be like eight games below 500. Maybe they could find a way to be within three games of both the Cleveland Guardians and the Minnesota Twins. But that will do it for this episode of the Sox Machine Podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening. And James Fegan, thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure, sir. Thanks for having me. Uh, great to use my work-issued mic again, even though it didn't work. So it really just stood here and was like a paperweight. <laughs> Um, great to use this Zoom background again. Uh, my, it's a great Zoom background. My sports writer award is up here somewhere. Out of frame. Great use it's been to me these last <laughs> few weeks, but uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Hopefully we could do this again soon. And Jim, 
Uh, we'll chat on the Sunday night. Uh, you'll be carrying some of the load for me next week as I'll be off. And one programming note, folks, with the Major League Baseball draft upcoming, I'll be it, recording a new podcast with one of our best friends, Jim Callis of MLB.com, over the weekend. So we'll have that as a good primer of what to expect for the 2023 Major League Baseball draft overall and what the Chicago White Sox could possibly do at pick 15. So that's something to look forward to this upcoming week as uh, I'll be mostly off as uh, I'll be getting married. But it will be good to see you next week, Jim. Indeed. Looking forward to it. Uh, Friday, big day. Friday is a big day. Absolutely. Next Friday. Next Friday. Not yes. tomorrow. Well, tomorrow could be a big day right. for anybody. It could be your birthday if you're listening. <laughs> listeners so if it is happy birthday but again thank you so much for listening to this episode of the socks machine podcast if you just discovered the socks machine podcast you can subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts such as spotify and apple music you can follow us on twitter we're at socks machine you can follow me on twitter at socks machine underscore josh you can follow james on twitter at jr Fegan. And with the podcast, every episode, we also upload a video version version of it on our YouTube page at youtube.com slash Socks Machine. If you enjoy our work and you want more, you can get more by becoming a Patreon supporter at patreon.com slash Socks Machine, where our Patreon supporters get exclusive content. They get ad-free versions of both the podcast and the website. And when we have new Socks Machine swag at the Socks Machine store, we're the first ones to receive it. Monthly plans start at $2, or you can save with an annual subscription. Again, you can sign up at patreon.com slash Socks Machine. The Socks Machine podcast is a production of SocksMachine.com. You're on for all of things Chicago White Sox baseball and part of the Blue Wire podcast network. Alongside Jim Margulis and James Vegan, I'm Josh Nelson. Thanks for listening and watching. Mm-hmm.